So you got your CO2 installed, you got everything up and running, but how do you know you got enough or is it too little? And what about if I kill my fish because I made a mistake? Don't worry, I'm gonna help you through that. I've lived this and I know what to do so I could sleep at night and the fish. So if you need to check out the beginner's guide just to know how everything works in this and what all the component names are, click right here, but make sure to come back and check out how to set it up because that's what this video is gonna be, is about dialing in your system for the right amount of CO2. First, let's run over the basics so you can get the most out of your CO2 system. The system comes on one to two hours before your lights turn on. This will give the plants plenty of CO2 available for when the lights come on so they can right away start cranking that photosynthesis process and producing all that sugar they need to grow. You want your CO2 system to turn off with the light. Some people will say turn off an hour before. Personally, mine turns off with the light. That's something we'll get into a little bit later and dialing it in what's perfect for you. But for the most part, CO2 off with the light. You want plenty of surface agitation and there's plenty of reasons for this. One, you can oxygenate the water and inject CO2 at the same time. Two, that added surface agitation gives you an extra safety barrier so that you don't deplete all the oxygen in the water because the fish are using it and we're kind of displacing some with that CO2. So surface agitation, even though you may be losing a little CO2 through it, it's really well worth it. And CO2 is so cheap in the overall actual CO2 itself, you're not really wasting it. Third is that at night, or should I say early morning, right before sunrise, you have the lowest levels of oxygen then because in the nighttime, plants are actually using oxygen as part of completing the photosynthesis process and your fish are respirating at the same time, but the plants aren't producing any oxygen. So this is why we see our lowest levels. Big galleries and famous places will raise the lily pipes at nighttime to add that extra surface agitation. And maybe that's a little bit much for you. So a tip is, you can run air stones at night offset opposite of the light in order to put that extra surface agitation in there. For me, I run sponge filters 24 seven and I also use them to increase flow around the tank. I'll put a tag up here for a video that shows you how I'm using the sponge filters for additional flow for distribution of CO2 in my tank. So the first thing we wanna do is get the flow going in the tank. So when the system is running, how do we know how much we're injecting? We do that by bubbles per second or BPS. I've kind of found that one bubble per second per 10 gallons is roughly the rule in my 10 gallon tank when I first started with Reactor many, many moons ago. It was one bubble per second was perfect for that tank. In this 40 breeder, I probably would say I'm about five, maybe six now. And there's a couple of reasons why I'd be up a little higher than the four, but we're gonna get into that in a few minutes. But bubbles per second, let's get this going. Let's see where you're at, take a reading, and then you'll know if that's a good starting point or not. And like I've said in the past video, we wanna start off slow. So if you're a little bit on the low side, that's fine. You're better off working your way into it than overshooting and coming back and possibly hurting the fish. So when you inject CO2 into your tank, carbon dioxide is a weak acid and will actually lower the pH of your tank. And so what I want you to do is I want you to target that one pH drop from when there's no CO2 to when we're injecting CO2. Now this changing pH isn't what you hear about everybody talking about pH swings and stuff like that. That's a little different. We're gonna get into that technical side of pH a little bit later, but just know that by injecting CO2, the pH is gonna drop and that's how we're gonna check how we've got enough CO2 in the water or not. It is very important for you to watch your livestock because some fish can tolerate much drastic pH swing versus fish that don't really tolerate it as well. But for the most part, 30 ppm is pretty tolerable by the majority of the fish that are kept in the hobby. So how do you know if you have enough CO2 injected in the water? This can be kind of difficult. So they sell super expensive machines that are about $5,000 just to check the amount of CO2 that's in your water. And that machine would be over the cost of most high tech tanks. They also sell drop checkers and which is the most common and we see them in everybody's tank. The problems that you have with a drop checker is that it's a very delayed reaction to when you've made a change to what it is. It's usually about two hours behind. So you could actually be at a very dangerous level and the drop checker looking fine because two hours from now, it's gonna tell you it's at a dangerous level. 
One thing that you see all the time and it is incorrect is mounting the drop checker high in the tank. This could be a false positive because you could be getting bubbles into the drop checker because bubbles are always rising. Bubbles are never dropping unless they're in the downflow, which is your target. But what I always recommend is that it is on the opposite side of the tank of your diffuser and mount it as low as possible. This will ensure you have good saturation of, of CO2 throughout the whole height of the water column and that you're not getting bubbles into the CO2 or sorry, into the drop checker, giving you a false positive. The third major problem is that with a drop checker, when you're at 7.0 pH and when you're at 6.4 pH, that drop checker is green. And there is a big difference between 7.0 and 6.4 in the amount of CO2 that's in the water. We can be more on that a little bit later, but that discrepancy is a big problem. And why a lot of people think that, well, I've got CO2 and my plants aren't thriving, it's because it's really not enough because the discerning of the green color could be so close in those ranges, it's really hard for the human eye to detect those differences. It's really a matter of interpretation. So the most accurate way for us as hobbyists to measure CO2 is called the pH drop method. And we're going to talk about that now. What you first need to do is take a sample water from your tank and you need to take it out and you need to stir that a lot. And you need to let that sit out for hours, if not days. Very recently, I saw a post from Tom Barr that talks about how many days it took for a, a sample to degas. And it was nearly two days before it completely degassed all the dissolved CO2 that's in the sample from the tank. So after you've got your degas sample, what we wanna do is we wanna target one pH drop from there. The reason it's one pH drop is because when we drop one pH from the tank's resting pH, to the injected pH one below that, it's gonna be 10 times more. Now, Henry's law stipulates there is 0.6 CO2 in standing water. Now, the, your fish tank will usually be between two and three because of respiration of fish, some microbials, plants, rot, all different things going on in your aquarium are gonna bring up that CO2 level. So once we get to one pH below the tank's resting pH, we have now 10 times the amount of CO2 in the water than we did before we started injecting. Every 0.1 is 26% more than what was before. And that goes back to what I was saying about the difference in a drop checker at 7.0 and 6.4. At 7.0, theoretically, the water is going to have about 10 ppm almost 11 ppm of CO2. At 6.4, you're gonna have 45 ppm because that little bit of a change is putting in 26% more each time. So it's a very rocket up scale of how fast it's gonna start collecting CO2 in the water. You're gonna see there's a chart online that talks about KH and pH and how much CO2 is in the water. And this is related to injecting CO2 into the water and isn't really a rule, but more of a guideline of understanding the relationship of KH and pH. So here's where it gets a little dicey. And this is from one of my own personal experiences is that I made an adjustment and then I didn't come back and check it. And I'm talking just cracking the needle valve a little bit and then went to bed and then woke up in the middle of the night and realized I didn't check the adjustment, ran over to my tank and my 10 gallon beta at the time was at the surface gasping and I was obviously gassing out all the fish and thank God a labyrinth fish could breathe. But unfortunately, the auto sink list in the tank didn't make it and it was my fault and I felt absolutely horrible because I made a mistake that killed my fish. At this point, I needed to find an answer so I could never do this again. So sure, hard rule number one, never make an adjustment unless you have the time to commit. But two, I needed a fail safe that would give me consistency of delivery because that is ultimately the most important part of CO2 is that it's consistently the same day after day so the plants are prepared for it but I also needed a safeguard. So if I did make a change or I did make a mistake, I don't gas and kill all my fish. So the answer is a pH controller. A pH controller will turn off the CO2 
by controlling the solenoid based on pH. So you install the pH controller and what it does is that it controls the power supply to the solenoid so that once the target level has been achieved, it shuts off the, the CO2. Another major advantage of this is that when we first turn that CO2 on, I can run more CO2 faster to achieve maximum levels by the time the light turns on. And then once it hits that level, it shuts off and it maintains this slight float, but it's always consistent throughout the day rather than me trying to set amount delivery that is going to slowly throughout the day drop to a level and then eventually turn off where right now I'm just going to drop to it and maintain. So rather than have a curve coming into it, I'm going to come down to the level, hold that level, and at the end of the day, return back up. And now the plants will have the maximum amount all throughout the day to photosynthesize and not be limited by the amount available. So the pros and cons of the pH controller, like I said, the rate of, of delivery, I don't even leave the bubble counter filled anymore because the pH controller ultimately is making sure that once it hits the level, it turns off. So you can inject at a higher rate. It turns off when the desired pH is there. So if you had a problem and tank dump, if you had a problem related to some sort of delivery failure, then it's still gonna shut off and not gas out the fish because once we've hit this level, we can turn it off. Consistent levels of pH are everything, even if you're just gonna use a drop checker, that you don't necessarily have to be at 30, but at the lower level, some plants may not thrive, so you wanna push a little bit harder, and that's totally understandable, but it's gotta be the same. So if you make a change, and once you've found the number, let that ride for two weeks. The plants have to adapt every time you make a change. So we want things to be as consistent as possible so they have the best chance to thrive. Some of the cons of a pH controller, the upfront cost. It is another thing to buy. They're over a hundred bucks. I recommend buying the Milwaukee one like I have. I've had great success with it. It's been very good. You do need to buy the solutions for calibration. And that is another thing. You do need to calibrate your sensor. And what I like to do is use a pH controller and a drop checker as a backup method to make sure that they're both in spec. And one time I saw that the pH was reading low, but the drop checker was blue. So I knew there was something wrong with the with the sensor. And the, the, the pH probe does go bad after time. They are wearable, so you will have to replace it. I've been getting about a year, maybe a little more per pH probe. I run it 365 days a year. I never take it out of the tank. But I do check its calibration probably two or three times a year. It's very simple and easy process. It's not hard to do, but in overall, it is something that you need to keep an eye on, so that would fall into the con list. So by adding a pH controller, no more worries about overdoing it and killing my fish, no more worries about inconsistent delivery, and no more worries about do I have the right amount of CO2 injected. This answers it all. In the next video right here, we're gonna go over the maintenance of your CO2 system, how do you clean the components that are involved, and what other kind of unexpected issues may arise when using CO2. See you over there.